Bases dropped on Soccer's morning show. Soccer down here February 1st. Happy MLS season pass premiere live day. Congratulations. We now are uh, open to the new universe when it comes to Major League Soccer and trying to figure out how we want to watch. Yes. (laughs) Happy MLS season pass day, everybody. So uh, how many of you have already signed on? How many of you have already gotten your account squared away? How many of you have already done all of your, all of the damage and all of the work and trying to get everything squared away to where you can watch everything? And apparently, uh, there's some very, very cool stuff that's already up. And so, uh, I, I will not have the chance to, to take part in it today. Uh, signing day. That's why we have only a, a Wall Pass Wednesday power hour. So, we're here for an hour and it's whatever's on your mind. And I imagine that a lot of it is probably going to be dealing with uh, the signing day that happened yesterday, the different signing day, where Chelsea apparently has now dropped over $800 million in signing a lot of folks. And uh, Bully Clear Lake has just finally decided, yeah, we're just going to go ahead and buy everybody and buy everything. And we're going to pay $120 million over X number of years to pick up Enzo Fernandez. Great piece of business for River. I'll tell you that. 30 million for River, I believe, if the if uh, I remember correctly. But uh <laughs> Ricky, atta boy. Atta boy, Ricky. Uh Sean, uh got your email. You haven't opened it. You're kind of busy. Uh Amelia's waiting for his code. Ricky's waited for uh uh all the Atlanta United content, which by the way, free to access right now. So, uh, yes, let the countdown begin 24 days until opening day. And we get to see how things are completely and totally laid out. Well, yeah, and uh, and Sean, we can talk about the Hucking Zayach. Transfers that don't go through, which you get waiting for the last minute. Uh Uh-oh, Alex got an error message. He got the code, hit an error. All right. So uh, they got to get they got to get their They got to get their act together. Uh, yeah, Michael, Chelsea's got so many new players. Some will not be able to play in champions league. I know, uh, here's the, here's the numbers. A- and I guess this will classify as opening kickoff once again. Uh, oh, Sean. Wow. Okay. <laughs> Sean, uh, taking no prisoners this morning. Uh, user error since he's a Newcastle fan. Okay. Here's the deal. And I guess this will uh, need a new version of iOS. Wow, okay. Did not know that. See, I'm learning about all of these things because I can pretty much guarantee you that when we uh, uh, figure things out that, uh, you know, it will be uh, everything. Uh, everything will be the way that we want it to be, and we'll just be able to log on and get all of our stuff. Uh, office security blocked then on your phone and then told you need a new iOS. Okay, so Tofka has been blocked. Ricky's saying update all your devices because he had to do that first. Um, I know, Amelia, and like I said, this is Wall Pass Wednesday. We're here for an hour, so it's whatever's on your mind. Seriously. Uh, will you conversation for an hour? And this will be posted, obviously, later in the morning as we juggle National Signing Day. And for the record, uh, National Signing Day coverage, 8 o'clock tonight on GPB Sports, all the GPB Sports platforms. Matt Stewart and myself will go through the day. Got a lot of interviews planned for uh, OG Signing Day, as Ricky uh, wrote wrote about yesterday, and I think I'm going to stick with that. So, Ricky, if on the coverage tonight you hear OG Signing Day, that's an homage to you, sir. Here's the deal. Uh, Opening kickoff brought to us by our friends at Kickoff Coffee, kickoffcoffeeco.com. We're going to go by the numbers. We're going to go by the numbers here and lay everything out. So, according to our friends at uh, Agence France Press, Premier League clubs spent a record 815 million pounds or a billion dollars in the January window, nearly double the previous highest figure according to Deloitte. Deals came thick and fast in the final hours of the window. Enzo Fernandez from Benfica for 121 million euro, 132 million dollars. The gross spend was 90% higher than the previous record, 430 million pounds back in 2018, and almost triple the previous January window. Uh, Yes, Michael, we will get into that in in a bit. Combined with 
The record 1.9 billion pounds spend during the summer transfer window. Premier League clubs have splurged 2.8 billion pounds during the 22-23 season, a new all-time high. Deadline day expenditure by Premier League clubs of 275 million, also a new record for January, blowing up the previous mark. Five of the top six revenue generating clubs accounted for more than half of the total gross spend, with Chelsea responsible for more than a third of the total league expenditure. Premier League's huge spending backed by record revenues and broadcast rights for the 22 to 25 cycle. For the first time, international TV rights sales outstripped the figure for the UK domestic market, taking the total to more than 10 billion over three years. Premier League clubs, this is a copy from AFP. Blew their European rivals out of the water, accounting for 79% of total spending across Europe's major football leagues in January. Highest proportion ever reported. Transfer spending fell across the rest of Europe's five big leagues from 396 million euro in the January 22 window to 255. So basically down about a quarter. President of La Liga, Javier Tebas, accused the majority of Premier League clubs of economic doping. Economic doping. That's what he said. He tweeted, we read about the strength of the Premier League, but it is not like that. It is competition built on clubs making multi-million dollar losses. Uh, Knock on the door, your buddy's up at Barcelona, sir. Tim Bridge. Lead partner in Deloitte Sports Business Group said Premier League spending was beyond anything that we've seen before. Quote, it is a clear indication of talent acquisition being core to Premier League clubs' business strategies in securing the best talent available. Clubs hope to improve results on the field, which in turn will enhance the appeal of the Premier League and further cement its position at the very top of world football. Bridge warned there's a fine balance between prioritizing success on the pitch, maintaining financial sustainability, also highlighted the lack of domestic business. More than 85% of the Premier League club's gross spend was directed toward acquiring players outside the UK. Bridge said the decline would be of concern to lower tier clubs in England and could further fuel debate around a more even distribution of finances. Uh, Callum Ross Sports Business Group said many clubs across Europe had sold valuable talent as they sought to prioritize financial stability. Quote, the rest of the big five leagues in Europe have had more subdued spending power, likely impacted by negative growth in their broadcast rights in the most recent cycle, while at the same time, some European clubs are still recovering post-pandemic. And the numbers that Chelsea, and so, um, yeah, so uh, Michael Head, here, here's your numbers for Chelsea. Here, here's Todd Bowley's winter signings, courtesy of our friends at CBS Sports Golasso. $372.4 million spent in one month. Enzo Fernandez at 131.4. Mikhailo Mudrik at 76. Noni Madweke from PSV at 43. Benoit Badiashile from uh, Monaco. I was about to say Monaco. Monaco, 41. Malo Gusto from Lyon at 32.5. Andre Santos, Vasco da Gama, 13.5. David Datro Fofana from Molda at 13. Joao Felix on loan from Atletico Madrid for 12. Gaga Slanina from the Chicago Fire at 10. So that's what you're getting with Bowley right now. And uh, yeah, we'll get into we'll get into everything else that we saw, Tom, because that was part of it. I was wondering how it was going to be uh, received for you. Uh, LFP will f- officially confirm PSG's failed Zayac appeal later today. The decision, according to Ben Jacobs. Decision due to an unjustifiable delay in sending documents was the only tra- wasn't the only transfer appeal heard LFP key not to set any precedent for approving late paperwork. So yes, happy MLS season pass day. All right. So what? Uh, let's see what's on your your mind this morning, um, Amelia. So what do we think about the babble about Luis Arujo allegedly not minding going back to Brazil? Babble until further notice. Tom looking at it. Uh, I don't know how many, uh, let me, let me check the, check your sourcing on these kinds of things. We'll keep an eye, keep an eye on all of this. Uh, all right. So, uh, came from Tiago Fernandez last night, 32.2 thousand followers, gold BR and bond TV. Uh, Aruju wants to return to Brazil, consulted by Palmeiras. Many details about the player's desire and existence of others interested in the text at goal.com. So as 
as we look at it, once again, it's from Goal. Willing to talk about returning to his home country in the football market, still has no formal proposal for the return. So there you go. That was literally in the opening sentences. Um, all right. So let's see. Uh, everybody getting their new codes. You've got to update iOS first. Uh, Tom uh, and Ropes with Everton. Sean Deitch left the training facility, what, about an hour and 20 minutes before the end of the window? That should have told you everything you needed. Uh, Kevin Thelwell was still apparently there until Big Ben chimed, but nothing happened. Uh, you know, attempted to fly to England. Wouldn't be a surprise. Uh, yeah, it, it, it ain't good. Uh, Michael Head. Uh, yeah, most of the big time high school players did sign in December. Uh, as the reason that we have a power hour today, but, uh, some held off. And also what you're seeing is that when a lot of the folks sign in just around Christmas, then that leaves everybody else trying to figure out, okay, where can I go? What can I do? That kind of stuff. What you'll see today, there are a couple of big names on the board. And you will also see the finalizing of recruiting classes for the group of fives, the lower divisions, one double A, division two, that kind of a thing. So if you have uh, really good players, really small classifications, you'll see them going to one double A programs, division two, that kind of stuff. You'll see a lot of that today. And also uh, a lot of the, the institutions of higher learning. We're seeing a lot of Ivy League signings already this morning. So from... Uh, players for teams that you follow when it comes to high school football. There are big names that decided to lay out for one reason or another. There will be some of that today. Most of what you'll see today is teams filling in their holes, uh, their gaps for uh, not the top 25, top 50 uh, recruiting classes. You're looking at teams that are in the lower parts of their conferences when it comes to football. The, the ones that are just bowl eligible are ones with losing records. Uh, the group of five conferences, you'll see that, them filling in their, uh, their recruiting classes, Division One, AA, Division Two, that kind of stuff. So that's what you're going to be seeing today. Though There are a lot of good athletes that are still out there, and it will be interesting to see where they go. The ones that I'm tracking, uh, you're looking at Division Two, II, Division Three, One, AA, NAIA, that kind of stuff. That's what I'm looking at today. And so uh, coverage starting at 8 o'clock tonight on the GPB Sports Platforms. Matt Stewart and myself will take you through the day. We do have a lot of interviews planned, but we'll take you through the day and lay everything out for you. Uh, Nick's just got his MLS season pass info for season ticket holders. Update iOS. Update iOS and update your iPad. Update it first. Uh, and, yes, yeah, so, uh Tom continues to to rail on his beloved Everton. Uh, th this one I'm not going to post because uh, if we had a visual uh, explicit warning, uh, how is it Chelsea can spend nearly $500 million over the last two windows, but Everton can't spend a dime? It's ludicrous. Uh, yeah, well, when you have new owners and they can sit there and they've got funds and can shift funds from one place to the other, uh, Egbali and Bully Clear Lake, they're really dropping a lot of money. Uh, let's see. So, Nick's with his beloved Lester. Uh, top uh, issued $194 million in shares to offset the current debt. Don't get how you can do this either, but yay. Um, okay. Uh, my guess, Jason, when you have something like this, you're just basically printing money. You're, you're diluting the value of your own product by printing more shares or what have what have you to try to offset or or uh kick the kick the debt can down the road a little bit i think that what i think what top just did basically it's like yeah i'm gonna print some more i'm gonna print some more money and spread out the debt and anybody that wants to pick up shares can he would still end up being i imagine he's not going to give up controlling interest in in anything King Power or Lester based, but I think what you're doing here is you're trying to sit there and remember Lester has been a club that uh, has leveraged future TV contract money to take care of current debt. 
They did that, I want to say, last year, two years ago. So the situation for Lester really wasn't, it really hasn't been all that great for a couple of years now. And so now you have uh, the owners issuing $194 million in shares to offset the debt. So I think that basically what you did is you just printed, you printed stock certificates to try to have folks, oh, I want, you know, I want in on Lester. And it's, you know, it's a dangerous game because if somebody ends up gobbling up all those other shares and uh, you have top and then you have the other individuals and then you have the the one guy who comes in or that consortium that comes in to try to pick up all the other shares could be could be a dangerous stuff for Lester going forward. Uh, yeah, Michael, uh, on top of the two hundred and fifty million in the summer. I uh, hope the new guys make a difference and do not pull an Obama Yang. Yeah, I know that you and a lot of clubs are, are looking at it that way. Uh, also on the board, uh, Sam hopes that his uh, LSU Tigers have a good day, G-E-A-U-X. Uh, Tofka says, iPhone 7 will not support iOS 16. It's too old. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Michael, a lot of lower division signings today. Lots of Auburn action today as he runs for cover. Um, you actually had a pretty decent December. This could be just, like I said, you, you might have a couple of slots left available for folks and, and uh, scholarships and folks who decided to portal, those kinds of things. Uh, any kind of, you know, any kind of thing like that. I mean, uh, Auburn under Hugh Freeze did surprisingly well in a very quick amount of time and tried to jump up the standings as best as best they could. So we'll see what, what Auburn does today. Um, uh, yeah, and, uh, Emilio is having, uh, updating iOS when things become available. Ricky, to your point, automatic updates will be your best friend. Set your updates to automatics because much like a guy like me, I'm right there with Emilio. Um, when it comes to updating apps, things like that, it's like, you know, why do I, you know, things will be slowing down and everything. Oh, and then you go to the update app. I have to be reminded about updating things so sorry uh excuse me uh yeah automatic updates are your best friend make sure that you get your settings that way uh yeah ricky got a couple of signings in today and yeah the basketball game uh mr three at the buzzer and the the big uh big 12 big 10 12 challenge whichever conference it was where you were playing west virginia bart keeler i'm sure next time we have bart on we can talk about west virginia and the big 12 challenge big 10 challenge big 12 challenge Big 12 challenge uh, with Auburn and West Virginia as things continue to go forward. Uh, I don't know if you saw this earlier this morning. Uh, Antonio Conte is stepping away from his uh, head coachness at Spurs. He is uh, uh, going to recuperate from gallbladder surgery. Confirmed that he was due to have his gallbladder removed on Wednesday after recently suffering from severe abdominal pain. Didn't put a time frame on it referred to it as a period of recuperation. Following a diagnosis of cholecystitis, he will be undergoing surgery to remove his gallbladder today, assuming that it's already either underway or has already happened. Uh, Everyone at the club wishes him well. The NHS, and this is courtesy of our friends at uh, The Athletic, inflammation of the gallbladder surgery, a cholecystectomy may be recommended to prevent the condition coming back or reducing the risk of complications, can take between two and eight weeks to return to full activities after gallbladder surgery, depending on the type of procedure. Christian Stellini is the club's assistant manager, oversaw duties with the win over Preston North End. They have Manchester City on Sunday, fifth in the table. And to be perfectly honest, this would not surprise me if you ended up as once again with Antonio Conte, uh, not renewing his contract at the end of this season. Right now, the end of the season is the end of the deal. And Antonio Conte has said publicly how he has had friends who were very, very close to him. He lost friends late last year, early this year. He's lost three very close friends to him. And if that didn't make him think twice uh, about going home, not renewing contracts, whatever, taking a sabbatical, taking a break. Uh, This probably does reinforce that notion. You lose friends, 
your body's breaking down, your, your body has an inflammation in the gallbladder, you have surgery. Uh, I would not be surprised one bit if Antonio Conte did not renew his contract and just went home to uh, just to recover in uh, long form. And the biggest thing is uh, what we're thinking. So, uh, all right. So I did not. So, all right. So here's what we'll do. All right. I'll, I'll bring in, I'll bring in folks. Uh, all right. Let me see if I can, if I can pull this off here. And we'll, we'll discuss stuff. And uh, since I was alerted to uh, folks that I did or didn't send stuff to, we'll probably be joined by Bart Keeler here in short order. Um, because like I said, we're here for an hour. It's whatever you guys want to talk about this morning. And it is uh, all across the board. So uh, we've been talking college basketball. We've been talking Happy Season Plus Day. Uh, Canadian Championship, they had their draw. San Francisco Earthquake signed Carlos Gruezo from Augsburg. And Inter-Miami did sign Sergei Kryptsov, the Ukrainian international center back uh, from Shakhtar Donetsk. Another experienced signing, signed through the 24 season with an option for 25. Played has played for uh, Donetsk since 2010, 31 caps for his home country, 17 titles, 13 years. Composed defender, so Kritsov now joins the uh, Inter-Miami back line. Toussaint Ricketts retired. He's joining the uh, uh, Vancouver Whitecaps staff. Musa Jite has been loaned from Austin FC to League One's Ayakio. So uh, AC... AC Ayakio, Musa Jite on loan from Austin FC. There's uh, a lot of that that uh, is out there as well. You know, there's a lot of the the gossip, rumor, and innuendo that we have. We've got stuff to talk about. We got stuff to watch. We got all kinds of things that are out this morning. Uh, Manchester City planning a move for James Madison in the summer. That's from the four letter paper. Take it at your own peril. Uh, uh, let's see. So I'm having conversations with Bart as we go and let's see if he can make it because like I said, we're only on until uh, 10 5 this morning because of national signing day. So, uh, so we'll see what happens this morning. And, and by the way, if you haven't had the chance, uh, it was a great, um, it was a great interview that we did uh, with John Schuster yesterday. Uh, John Schuster, you know, you know, Schuster with uh, uh, the gold medal winning folks in Pyeongchang, and he's now co-owner of Duluth FC in the NPSL. And so that was a great interview that we had with Schuster yesterday. And if you missed it, it's on the network. Uh, it's about 15 minutes, goes into the background of uh, how he ended up with uh, how he ended up being uh, involved in the soccer scene in Duluth, Minnesota. And now he's a co-owner and how he had uh, players for Duluth FC billeted in his basement. And uh, two of them, and one of them actually played against Atlanta United this past weekend for Chattanooga FC. So we had a conversation about Caleb Tammy and Kostya uh, uh, Domor uh, Domorotsky uh, after we were off the air. So it was pretty funny. Uh, getting that kind of closeness where you're referencing players that folks know. Anyways, a good interview with uh, John Schuster. So if you missed it, you get to see how curling and soccer combine. And he now has a golden ticket. John Schuster has golden ticket status here at SDH. So anything involving Minnesota United, anything involving Duluth FC, anything involving soccer in general. Uh, I've told him, I said, you can crash the show anytime you want. I told him when the show airs, when it starts. And uh, so John Schuster now has golden ticket status here at SDH for Soccer's Morning Show. So, uh, John, here you there. Once again, we're here till uh, 10.05 because of National Signing Day. And we'll see what kind of trouble we can get into. Uh, loan move to Inter Milan was never an option for Manchester United and Harry Maguire. He's going to stay at Old Trafford till the end of the year. Chelsea asked Inter Milan about selling Nicola Barella, but they were not prepared to let him go. PSG. Appealed to LPF about Hakim Zayich. They lost out on that. 
Inter Milan chief exec Giuseppe Marotta says Milan Skriniar has made the choice not to sign a new deal is going to leave on the free in the summer. Bournemouth turned down the chance to sign Nicolo Zaniolo after he had a change of heart about joining. So Bournemouth, okay, so let me see if I get this straight. Bournemouth wanted Zaniolo. Zaniolo didn't want to go. Then Zaniolo was like, yeah, I'll go. Bournemouth was like, nah, we're all right. Good work. West Brom's loan deal for Chelsea's uh, Omari Hutchinson fell through on deadline day after they signed Mark Albrighton on loan from Leicester City. AC Milan denies their attentions in negotiations over a new contract with uh, Portugal forward Rafael Leal. Talks taking place in a professional way, whatever that means. Barcelona tried to sign Sofian Amrabat from Fiorentina on loan with an obligation to buy, but uh, Fiorentina rejected the offer. And Bayern Munich rejected Inter Milan's advances for Benjamin Pavard in the final hours of the transfer window. So that's the the early round of uh, gossip, rumor, and innuendo. How did yeah, and PSG is apparently very, very they they are hacked off about not getting uh, Hakim Zayek just squared away. Melissa Reddy, Kave Sol, uh, uh collapsed with Liga unwilling to ratify the transfer following submission of documents. Apparently, Chelsea was like an hour late, and it didn't work. Uh, alleging Stanford Bridge had initially sent through the incorrect paperwork after the terms of the agreement had been agreed to. When it was flagged, they claimed Chelsea sent the right documents without a signature. Correct version was received. Time had already passed. So they met, uh, the LFP met 5.30 this morning, our time. And uh, obviously they went thumbs down on it. So that's, and Chelsea has yet to comment. And uh, Zeitch passed his medical. He was waiting in the office for SG. And it uh, didn't go down. So, uh, Bart, we have had conversation. By the way, welcome for the uh, final half hour of the show this morning because of National Signing Day. Yeah. I, um Excited to see who West Virginia signs and then turns into a not performing starter. <laughs> uh, if that gives you any level of my uh, confidence in our coaching staff. Well, it, but also the conversation went to basketball because of the Auburn folks that are in the timeline and they wanted to go over the SEC Big 12 challenge where uh, West Virginia. I mean, if y'all want to go over that, we can talk about the fact that West Virginia beat Auburn, um, mm-hmm. you know. Fantastic. I told y'all we have a great non-conference record. Mm-hmm. The Big 12 in basketball is what the SEC thinks it is in football. That's my hot take for the day. Ooh, there you go. Uh, yeah, <laughs> so Ricky's like, no one wants to go over it. Um, so that's – that's uh, it, it started a conversation. You're bringing the West Virginia guy. Then it's like, no, we don't want to talk about it anymore. Um, so yesterday – actually, let's go back. Let, let's go back to – uh, match number two, since we didn't get the chance to, to talk yeah. about it over the weekend. And uh, I was watching it in a hotel room in East Ridge, Tennessee. And I had the sound down, and I think that's pretty much what a lot of folks got out of it. Yeah, I think you're um, you're probably right to not fully watch and been engaged in that match. Um, <laughs> a nil-nil draw, I don't think we learned really anything. Actually, that's false. I think we learned some negative things. Um, unfortunately, from that match. And that was the fact that all five of the players in this camp that were a part of the 2022 World Cup were in that game. And then you add in even um, uh, Paul Ariola, who probably was tw- man 27 or 28 in that decision. And none of those guys looked like the difference makers at all. They certainly didn't make the team better. And that's really concerning. Outside of, I'll give Sean Johnson a pass, because I thought he was very good. But um, it's just very concerning that you have Long and Zimmerman start, Kellen Acosta start, um, you know, Jesus Ferreira starts, Paul Ariola starts, and you didn't look very good at all. Uh, defensively, sure, you looked okay, but like Columbia also wasn't very good. Um, and that's concerning, and I think a sign that it's truly time to, to find. I don't even say replacements, but the people who now take their spots on the roster. And I can and I can sense the uh, the the frustration 
And, and I mean, if if you were on camera and had papers and we were watching you live, I just had this vision of you throwing a stack of papers live in the air repeatedly, <laughs> repeatedly over a 90 minute period. You know, it wasn't like it was all bad. I think that's what I would look at it. But it was the problem was that there was no real setup for them to be good. Um, and when you did have good moments, for example, Matthew Hoppy getting in on goal a couple of times, they didn't really go anywhere. Um, and you didn't really have any confidence that it would lead to anything. And, and But, you know, to be fair, that is more about the fact that it's a January camp than anything. It's just how it is. Um, Hoppy now on his way to Edinburgh, so congrats to him on a move to um, Hibs. Could go to a better club. Yeah, could go to a better club in that city, but, you know, he chose Hibs. <laughs> when you look at uh... – the uh, the organized version of signing day overseas. What what takeaways do you have <laughs> with, with all of the money that was spent yesterday and most of it by Chelsea? Yeah, I think what Chelsea spent ninety percent of all the money spent yesterday, probably eleven um, billion dollars <laughs> spent. Uh, that's a lot. Um, I'm glad for Arsenal to sign Jorginho. I think that's going to be a good signing. Um, and we definitely noticed um, from that Man City match that. We do not have a true backup to Thomas Partey, and, and you need to have one for him because as soon as he exited that Man City match, um, not that Man City dominated, dominated, but they were certainly the better team and were putting us under sustained pressure, and, and that was mainly because Partey wasn't playing and, and um, Sammy Lakonga was not up to task. So you get a guy in Jorginho who probably will give a little more depth to the team. Um, that's a positive. Mm-hmm. And I see you're it's like, OK, that's that's a positive And that's where we're at. I mean, Chelsea, we, yeah. went, we went over the numbers for what Chelsea did before you came on. It was it was part of part of opening kickoff, just showing the absolute monetary, the monetary might of Chelsea. And then Bully clearly uh, Enzo Fernandez. And, you know, by the way, the signing of Enzo Fernandez for one thirty one point four is ridiculous yeah that is that is what a good world cup tournament can do for you yes absolutely i'm curious to see what his wages are i don't see that reported but hopefully he also gets a vast increase in his wages from benfica to there and you know to be quite honest i don't think right now um chelsea's a better position than benfica because benfica has a chance to a legitimate chance to make champions league next year and i think chelsea is far off that um now, granted, Chelsea just added, you know, the cost of the U.S. military to their lineup, so maybe they'll improve. But uh, I, I would, I would have hoped that he would have stayed at Benfica for a while, help him get to the Champions League, stay, stay there, and and hopefully leave a legacy. But you know, he chose to go to Chelsea because there's a lot of money involved, um, yeah. which is the only reason people ever choose to go to Chelsea. There's no other reason to go to that club. <laughs> Uh, let's see. According to uh, Nicola Shira, Enzo is getting 10 million euro a year. Raheem Sterling is <laughs> the highest paid player at 19.8 euro. That's not as much as I would have expected for Enzo, but probably a good increase for where he was at Benfica. I would, I would imagine that. Yes. Uh, and you look at just yesterday, it was, it seemed like everything was going through Chelsea and everybody else was just kind of like, yeah, we're cool. Except for, uh, Bournemouth, Bill Foley said he wanted to make a couple of moves. He made a couple of moves. Uh, basically they wanted Zaniolo and Zaniolo was like, nah. And then he was like, yeah, I'll go. Then Bournemouth was like, nah, we're good. Um, it's like you're seeing clubs toward the bottom. Nottingham Forest was making moves, but a lot of the folks toward the top were kind of standing pat and they weren't doing anything rash. Yeah. I mean, I think you look at what those clubs have already assembled, right? I, I do think that most of the time when you're looking at January transfer windows, you're looking for players who you're either looking for two options. One, you need immediate impact on your roster, which is, I think, the route Chelsea obviously had to go. Right. Um, or you're looking for some depth options, um, which is the way Arsenal went and some other clubs. But, you know, you didn't see a whole lot from Man City or, or any of those teams because they feel very confident with the roster they have. You know, and, and, and 
in the January window, there's no reason to spend money that you don't need to spend. Yeah. Uh, Tom Russo, the Airborne DJ, has been very, very angry this morning. Understandably so. Um, you know, when Sean Dyche leaves an hour and 20 minutes before the end of the window, he leaves the training facility. I'm out. It's like, I'm going to go grab dinner or, you know, you know I'm going to go through the drive through and go home. Kevin Thelwell was still there in the building. Uh, Liverpool Echo, uh, and Tom brings us this this morning. After 31 days of one of the most important windows in Everton's history, every side from 13th and below had made at least three signings. Everton, separated from the bottom of the table by goal difference alone, had made none. And yeah. so in all caps, he goes, board out, owner out, we're heading full steam ahead to League One or administration. And uh, to hell with them all. To hell with them all. You know, I don't disagree with the anger that any Everton fan has right now. I can't argue with it. I can't fault them for it because I feel like they definitely have been let down by their their club administration. Mm-hmm. Um, I agree that I'm surprised they didn't try to make any signings. Yeah, clearly their clearly their roster is not good enough. Um, you can't tell me that Everton doesn't Everton doesn't have enough money to pay players or sign a couple players. You know, I also don't know where I would begin to build their to rebuild their roster. <laughs> to be yeah. quite honest, you know, um, I don't know if it's uh, what position do you would you prioritize because they're all kind of bad. <laughs> yeah. for, I mean, personally, I would I would try to find an improvement in the back line. That would be the first thing I do because they are giving up a lot of goals. Yeah, um, they're not scoring a lot of goals, but they're giving up a lot of goals. Um, hopefully, Sean Dyche does resolve that. But I'm surprised that even with I, it seemed very clear they were going to sign Sean Dyche as a coach. Yes, surely you could have found some center backs or a fullback that fits a little bit more how he would like to play. You know, hard nosed defensively, um, but. I'm sorry, Everton fans. I really am. Yeah, it's looking pretty bad. Uh, and, and Vincent Company is held on to what Sean Dyche had and, and Dell Holdings and seems to be doing pretty well. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> Michael Head on the Twitch pitch, he just saw that the Titans are moving away from natural grass at Nissan due to injuries. Uh, Lucas, <laughs> Lucas, Lucas. How long have I told you that the reason Joseph Martinez got injured is solely because of Nashville? Yeah, the reason we're in this situation is solely because of Nashville's crap grass, crap, absolute crap. Uh, Lucas Panzi. I will hold no punches on that. Nashville has not been there. The facilities Nashville has played in have continually put players in harm's way. And uh, Lucas, but Panzi- turf is evil. Yeah, uh, Lucas Panzika, uh, who called uh, the match with me this past weekend with Atlanta United and Chattanooga FC. Great Man- job, by the way. I listened to all 10 minutes, and I was like, oh, that's John. <laughs> all 10 minutes of the match. There you I go. listened to a total of 10 minutes. So all set it down. I was I was on a, uh, on a baseball field watching my little brothers play an inner squad scrimmage, so I, that was way more entertaining than watching whatever it was that Atlanta United uh, did Saturday. Well, Which, by the a- way, y'all yeah. don't freak out. It, it is like... Of all the things that matter, that match is probably second to last on the list. Yeah. I'm just exciting. glad that we played soccer. That's where I'm at. Yeah. And uh, it was it, Lucas uh, off air mentioned to me, he thinks that it's close to a, a dozen injuries that have happened. Uh, Titans, uh, Nashville. Yeah. Because of that surface at Nissan. Yeah. And so, yeah, he's seen it firsthand. And so uh, the, uh, uh, you see, now I wish I had a rim shot uh, as, as part of my effects, uh, but what I can do is this. Uh, Michael says, in other news, uh, Atlanta United supporters are organizing a class action lawsuit against <laughs> Tennessee Titans. Uh, this is the closest thing that I have to a drop uh, when it comes to, to something like that. So let's, let, let me see if this works and doesn't distort it. Yeah! yeah! There you go. So uh, that, that's where you're at. So <laughs> Atlanta United fans are not necessarily a surprise. Uh, Tom says attack is where we need, uh, where you need it. Defense is okay, especially with Dyes. You'll get the most out of Tarkovsky and Connor Cody. So yeah, uh, I just, I feel like, I, I do feel like a signing would have just given the fans a little bit more to credit, oh, like no, a little bit more to like think about. Uh, and again, I still think a defensive signing would have been good, but you know, you also could have tried to sign. Someone in the midfield who can be a little bit more, 
tempo controlling would be the word I would use. That seems to be the buzzword that we use nowadays. That, so, you know, so just defines the hyphenated words, tempo controlling. We're, we're yeah, like, tempo controlling. But, you know, that also doesn't fit a Sean Dyke system. But, like, you know, someone who can at least, you can pass him the ball and he won't be dispossessed and he can help your offense actually set up an attack, which, again, I'm not quite sure that. Everton players know how to do that right now. <laughs> uh, there was a story that I've been talking about the last couple of days, um, and uh, it has come to the fore again. Uh, you know, we, we talk about FIFA and how they can't get out of their own way a lot of the time and, and don't really seem to care. Uh, from our buddy Rob Harris at Sky, and this is an update of a story that we talked about over the last couple of days. FIFA is, and, and tell me if you're shocked by this, FIFA is facing backlash from Women's World Cup co-hosts Australia and New Zealand over a potential oh, terrible. of the tournament by Saudi Arabia. Football officials mm -hmm. for Australia and New Zealand said they were disappointed not to be consulted about the deal with Visit Saudi by FIFA before reports emerged. They have written to the world governing body seeking urgent clarification. Human rights group Amnesty International urged FIFA to speak out on the need for more human rights reforms in Saudi Arabia rather than allowing its showpiece women's tournament to be used for sports washing, the country's image, and for the exploitation of players. There's more, but that's just the first part. You like Apple? Yeah. <laughs> My group chat uh, had some fun with this because we, uh, we're joking that, you know, at least we have um, men going with the women to act as their chaperones. So that's, that's a good thing. It's just uh, already playing the head. It, it's so it's so tone deaf from FIFA after all that we said about Qatar to then go out and get Saudi Arabia. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, Football Australia said it quote understands FIFA has entered into a destination partnership agreement for the tournament. The organization added, "We are very disappointed that Football Australia were not consulted on this matter prior to any decision being made." Football Australia and New Zealand Football have jointly written to FIFA to urgently clarify the situation. Separately, New Zealand Football said, quote, we are shocked and disappointed, end quote. To hear the reports about the sponsorship, Amnesty International said it's concerned about what it calls a rolling crackdown on human rights under Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman. Uh, FIFA had no immediate comment, and there was no response from the Saudi government. <laughs> Color me shocked on both accounts. Ay, 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 ay. And uh, Saudi Arabia is also considering that 2030 Men's World Cup big, bid alongside Egypt and Greece, and they have signed Lionel Messi to a uh, a, a frontman agreement, for lack of a, a better Yeah, bid. I saw that too. Yeah. So, yeah, not necessarily, not necessarily a surprise. Uh, but, yeah, I, I was round. I, yeah, I looked at that yesterday, and I'm like, yeah, not a surprise, by the way. Uh, oh, by the way, happy first uh, ML first MLS season pass day, Bart. Yeah, where you been at, John? I've watched all the matches from last year already. Like, I'm I'm rocking. I see. Now, for for all of that free content, uh, what have you, uh, what what have you gleaned so far? A lot of cool stuff so far on the free end. I I really do like the um, well, obviously being a season ticket holder, getting the the full pass. I like the fact that the full allotment of, of matches are on there from last season, um, as well as highlights. So, you know, obviously you can access those in the MLS app, but it's nice to have them all in one place. Um, I will be digging into some more of that content today for sure. Uh, Alex Basine just came back to the show. He had to update his apps to get his season pass to work. Apparently that's a thing too, where you've got to update all of your yeah, same thing I do with my mom and dad when they ask me why their phone's not working, tell them to update their apps. So. Yep. Uh, good idea. Knicks with Australian New Zealand FIFA show and Money Grease is the gears disappointing but not surprising. Uh, Tom also wants to talk about Mosqueda and Lopez. How did we get here with the cap? Um, Mosqueda, I mean, I would – first off, first off – I don't, don't understand the cap situation we have right now. I'm going to be real honest. Like, well, if you do, tell me because – Well, it, the thing is, is that <laughs> – it's, it's a larger issue that we've talked about repeatedly. We don't know what we don't know. And that's right. because of the lack of transparency from Major League Soccer about where the cap is, what you can do, what you yes. can't, what you can navigate, what you can have and what you can't. So our first reactions a lot of the time when we see stuff, like a deal yesterday involving Edwin Mosqueda to defense of Ijusticia, and it looks like, 
uh, Atlanta United might be getting. The published report was $2.7 million uh, loaned with an option to buy. The biggest element here above all of this, I would continue to remind folks, we don't know what we don't know because Major League Soccer is not like a lot of other leagues that we look at on a regular basis where we can sit here and go, you can go to NHLnumbers.com and you can right. see what the cap number is and who goes where and who's right up against it. You know what the cap number is in the NFL. You know who's way the hell over and is going to be paying luxury tax out there yin-yang until the cows come home. And you know that the Falcons are $54 million under the cap in dealing with right. players next year. In the NBA, you have trade simulators where you can sit there and work out, okay, well, if Trey, if I want to trade Trey Young, which would be a mistake, if you want to trade Trey Young someplace, what can you get in return? We don't have that kind of information with Major League Soccer. So first, my first thought in all of this is we don't know what we don't know. Yeah, and I think that's going to be the hard part for us as fans is we're not quite sure how those Mascara moves actually affects the cap space or is it a, a more of a roster move mechanism because that's another thing that we're not entirely sure of is who's an under 22 uh signing who is not who's an under 22 dp like all these different mechanisms and that's really john when you talk about like we don't have a uh nhlmoney.com like we don't have that in mls because we also don't know what exactly tam gam fam lamb lamb that yeah. we have lama yeah um <laughs> You know, we don't know what we have there, and that's the comp that's the complicated part because, you know, you can look at someone's salary, but you're not quite sure how much of that is. You know, you can assume that this much is TAM, but you don't know how much the TAM the team actually still has. Right, um, and that's what makes MLS confusing, as yes. well as all the other again roster mechanisms of designated player or U22 or homegrown or senior. Or, you know, all these things that uh, do make it hard for us to fully put together a picture of what a salary budget space looks like. And I get it because the structure of the league of major league soccer on the whole was meant to be a collective to work the entire mechanism forward. So you don't have somebody sprinting to the head of the line, like Bowley clear Lake and dropping $110 billion to try to win everything. You wanted to try to advance right. the league on the whole forward and bring everyone along. But in doing that, you create these AM mechanisms and Garber Bucks that we joke about repeatedly. But as the league continues to grow, and I think is at a critical juncture, because it is a top 12 league in the country, don't look at what our friends at first, uh, was it uh, 21st? gave you things they were 29th in the world compared to the Saudi league. You're at a critical juncture. You've got the world cup coming in 26. You have the league continuing to grow. You have owners that want to invest above and beyond current parameters. And yet you still have these mechanisms in place that were safeguards. So no one was left behind to begin with. And this is, you know, we talked about, you know, taking limitations off the cap, getting rid of Garber Bucks, getting rid of AM, adding a fourth DP, all of these things that I think are important going on. And I think that once again, going into another season with this TV deal, happy MLS first season pass day, that you've got to try to work toward the future. And February 1st of 2023, for different reasons, is hopefully that first step in pushing forward and being a top more than a top 12 league in the world. Yeah, and I think that's the goal of the the ultimate goal of this Apple TV deal is just you're going to get more money, um, and hopefully with that comes also more interest in the league, and then hopefully we get a little bit more transparency from MLS. Um, you know, that's the goal. Yeah, and, and you know, you you and Michael Head says that MLS makes it so hard to be a fan because of lack of transparency and confusing salary rules, etc. What I would also say. About Let's talk about confusing salary rules right now. Sorry, yeah. I'm going to go back. Chelsea with financial fair play. I'm not quite sure where that goes. But well, um, continue, what, John. What the well, what they've done is uh, what what the folks have done now is they looked at, at what Chelsea's doing and they're pushing FFP to five years as opposed to three, which is where it currently is. Yeah. So when you have Mudrick signing an eight year deal, 
that to me, all, all these eight year deals, all these four and a half year deals underneath the five, over the five, all of these long term deals where you can budget things out, which we see in Major League Soccer, not 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 foreign. But when you see these kinds of deals, that's why FFP is apparently going to be expanded to a five year process instead of just three. So right. eight year deals that you're seeing where you have Chelsea spending eleven billion dollars. They're allegedly keeping an eye on you, so we'll see how FFP goes over a five-year plan as opposed to a three-year plan. You know, just I mean, it's it's they're keeping an eye on it, but I want to see how much they're keeping an eye on it with this whole this whole shit that's right. busting out right now. Hey, John, before uh, you leave, because I know yeah. you're up against the clock. Well, I mean, um, ten, ten minute warning, yeah, yeah. I do want to I want to ask if anyone else saw um, Liga the Liga next. The, the <laughs> Mexican Federation put out um, a couple days ago um, this announcement that there's going to be a quote high level competition yeah in North America yeah in 2025 yeah a, I think our buddy Which John is Arnold is part of that yeah yeah John Arnold has been on it and but it hasn't been talked a lot about like within the U.S. men's national team circles because that means a lot for like that's a that's a big deal even if it's in Mexico. But it, it does say North America, which, by the way, Copa America only was announced in the U.S. So that seems like that's going to be a big tournament again for the U.S. to participate in. Confederation. As we look forward, you know, we'll see what it ends up being. Because, I mean, regardless, it's a really big opportunity for the U.S. to play more meaningful matches. But also just a really cool, you know, we complain all the time about not getting real good competition outside of, you know, our CONCACAF. Uh, competition and how bad that is it's a fantastic opportunity oh yeah no I, I i look i looked at it when i was seeing what uh what john was writing about and by the way if you if you have some spare if you have some spare change and can subscribe to what john arnold does uh full disclosure i do and uh tokayo is also of a golden ticket status and he can crash whenever he wants but yeah john does fantastic work in keeping yeah he does here in this hemisphere uh, you know, so finding that, finding all of that material and the possibility of bringing back Confederations Cup, just an idea. You know? It's, it, it may not be Confederations Cup, but I think it'll be very much something similar. Yes. But uh, yeah, um, I'm excited. I'm excited yeah. for Copa America. I'm really excited for the, the W Gold Cup because, um, that is going to increase the level of competition for the U.S. and Canada. Um, as we saw last summer in the CONCACAF Women's Championship, mm -hmm. it's it's hard to get really competitive matches outside of games against Canada and and to an extent Mexico. So getting add to adding Brazil, adding probably Colombia, Argentina, Chile, mm -hmm. just raises the level of competition across the, that tournament, and that's fantastic. I'm I'm hopeful. I'm hopeful. Yes. Slightly doubtful, but hopeful <laughs> that the money from that tournament, two things. One, the money from that tournament is given back to the women's footballing programs in those federations. Um, and also that there is actual marketing and promotion put into the tournament, not hosting it and hosting it alone, but actually trying to drive ticket sales. Yes. Um, I think it would be foolish for CONCACAF to not host that in the U.S. and play it in, you know, along the southwest border. But that, that means you're playing in a lot of places that support soccer very well. And mm -hmm. I think this is a big, big opportunity for the women's game here in this hemisphere because the hope is that you continue to have this particular type of tournament. The, the Women's Gold Cup, a standalone tournament on its own, not tied in with any other sort of qualification measures for the foreseeable future, the forever future, hopefully, because yeah. having that every four years is, um, or even two years, I'm sure is how they're going to do it. Yeah. Um, I mean, going to elevate the women's game because it will give them an opportunity to play meaningful matches, you know, outside of, it's hard when you get that USA Canada final and a women's championship that you know you're playing for, but like the job has already been done where you've qualified for the Olympics. You know, yeah. Um, or you've already qualified for the World Cup. This is a no. The prize is the finals. 
you know, winning the final is the prize. So that is, I'm hopeful that this is going to elevate women's soccer in not just CONCACAF, not just the U.S., but like this entire hemisphere. Well, and, you know, no offense to Harlingen, Texas, but I want it in some place other than Harlingen, Texas, because. Well, and that's where I'm thinking is like, you know, John, it, that year it was what, Houston and um, Edinburgh or whatever yeah. it was, Texas, yeah. right? Yeah. yeah, Edinburgh. I'm really looking at how do you put this in Houston, Austin, uh, L.A., San Jose, uh, San Diego, even now Kansas City, if their women's uh, facility is built in time for that. Yeah. You know, you have a lot of really good soccer specific stadiums in this country that are at a fully professional level. And, you know, look, you could use Kansas City or Louisville who, that are about 11, 12,000 seats, but still in big state cities. You know, like that was the thing about um, ATB Park is it's not near anything. Yeah. And that city is kind of off in the distance. I mean, it's like putting a, a, a stadium in Dublin, Georgia. Yeah, I mean, like, it's, it's, it's where... No offense to the Fighting Irish down there, but you know what I mean. Yeah, I mean, it was, it was, it's where the RGB Toros play in USL. Yeah, Kansas. which is fine. That's a great place for their, for their location, but like, it's just not where you want to put your confederational championship. Yeah, and it, the the whole idea of access. And yeah. First and foremost, uh, last time I checked, I don't know how many direct flights to Edinburgh, Texas. There, right? right. I mean, that, that's exactly the thing, right? How do you get, uh, uh, how do you get these in places where people not from that city can go to? Right, and because so you have people like me, people in the Twitch pitch who, if the game is in Nashville, will drive. To, I mean, we have a lot of us from AO Atlanta driving up to Nashville for the She Believes Cup, you yeah. know. Uh, if you have a game in Louisville or Cincinnati, you're going to get people from that region who are going to go watch it. Mm -hmm. But, and even if, if more, I mean, again, if, if it's the U.S. playing in Louisville, I'll go. But I'm not going to Edinburgh, Texas. No. Once again, no offense to Edinburgh, Texas, but it's an access issue. And I, yeah. think, I think you're selling yourself short when you put yourself in markets and venues like that, when you're right. trying to when you're trying to give the tournament the exposure that you're looking for from Edinburgh, Texas, it's no, it's yeah, it's, and and you've got a, a it's just not it's not what you need. So again, I'm hopeful that they treat this tournament with the respect it deserves and give it the hype that it deserves and put it in top tier soccer stadiums in this country. Um, you know, I, I think I've already mapped it out because this is what I do when I'm bored. But a <laughs> final in San Diego's new Snapdragon Stadium in 2024 makes a whole lot of sense. It's a 35,000 seat stadium, um, brand new in a city that is both Ameri uh, American as it is Mexican, to be quite honest, mm -hmm. um, and would give you a very, I mean, we've seen that their fan base, the San Diego loyal fan base, or not loyal. Wave, sorry, the San Diego Wave fan base. Well, but you out for matches there. You were and the loyal. I was going to say you were true, even though you were the San Diego, the loyal right. San Diego fan base for the Wave. We have we have two, yeah, we have two clubs doing very well with attendance there. Right. Um, and it's a, I mean, you put a final in San Diego, that's a worthwhile trip. Also, yeah. that's kind of how I feel about with the Gold Cup. I think they should just put the Gold Cup final in Vegas every every edition, because um, mm -hmm. why not? You know, I'm, I'm hopeful. I'm hopeful, John. I think this is a very good thing for women's soccer in this hemisphere because I think you see what Europe is doing. Mm -hmm. They have vastly elevated their game. The women's Euros has become, in my opinion, the premier women's footballing tournament right now. Right. It might be even better than the Olympics. Um, you know, definitely not at the World Cup level for obvious reasons, but it's, I think it's a better tournament than the Olympics. Um CONCACAF and CONCACAF have to respond, and they need to find a way to keep up with the European contenders because if not, you're going to be looking at a lot of those European teams outclassing them uh, when the time comes to play them. Yep. Uh, we got folks who are diving in on happy uh, first MLS season pass day. Nix uh, has seen no ads for MLS season pass. He goes, what is this non-advertising strategy? Just give out – You haven't seen ads for it? Man. Uh, <laughs> I've seen him on Twitter a lot. Uh, let's see. Then uh, Tom is watching. He goes, watching the top newcomers of 22 on Apple Plus, and they put Gareth Bale in it. So I mean, for 22, that makes sense. Yeah, I mean, I'm excited to dig into all that. Um, I'm going to go through the Atlanta United stuff today because um, I'm excited to see what they do for our club 
and how. And I do think that our club uh, historically has done a good job of telling its story, but putting it in a format that is more than just a couple YouTube series will be nice. Yes. Uh, a couple of other quick hitters before we go. Uh, the move of Chicho Arango to Pachuca from LAFC. Keep an eye on that. Uh, Julian Araujo from LAG to Barca. Spending time with Barca B. Probably getting some bench time. Big move for Araujo. Uh, Club World Cup. Reminder. You're going to be able to hear the officials discussing things when it comes to VAR at the Club World Cup. And you're going to get the announcement in stadium as to why they decided what they did. So when Club World Cup comes, watch out for that. Uh, and then uh, also... Uh, Keep an eye in your, your best vibes to George Campbell. Uh, got a knock in training for CF Montreal yesterday. Uh, so keep an eye on that for CF Montreal and George Campbell. And apparently, probably, hopefully, maybe, it is possible that your uh, brethren, Bart, that uh, were doing games with, uh, with Nisa, it looks like they might actually – be getting paid wow that would be awesome that that would be i mean look we've talked about refereeing programs needed to improve in this country that would be a big step up to get actually actually paid for doing professional work yeah uh it came out and apparently nisa is also going to be doing a nine team round robin deal weighted to uh regional rivalries and things so, yeah, update on the story about referees. Oh, the league has paid much of the money as it looks to a new season. So uh, Pyramid awesome. Soccer, Pyramid Refereeing Newsletter. So that uh, looks like that is getting close I'm to just glad Nisa's paying people. Yes. So we'll keep an eye on that. Uh, what's going on with uh, what, what's going on with uh, the Soccer for US POD and what else is going on with you? Well, I'll have an episode to you either today or tomorrow, depending on when I can get it edited because, <laughs> I'm, you know, having a real job. Uh, is confusing, and yes. uh, I'm actually in the back in the office high, uh, half the time, so that's why I'm off camera today. Um, so hopefully, getting one to you today or tomorrow. So uh, co recovering, we do we do mention the fact that we play two friendlies, but most of it is spent talking about um, the Ernie Stewart, Brian McBride, Greg Berhalter departures, and also the Copa America news. So. Um, more talking about the excitement and the, the future of, of U.S. soccer than what we just watched because um, outside of Brandon Vasquez scoring a goal, I ain't got a whole lot of positive for you, John. There you go. And apparently Kevin Patrick is the face of the Atlanta United background piece, according to the Soccer for Good OGs, and she's watching. Oh, I haven't gotten into that. That's exciting. Good for so, him. Good for Kevin Egan and for Kevin Patrick for both of them. Uh, he's, a, he's a decent dude. Yeah, he, he's a decent dude, and he calls a good Royal Rumble when he needs to. Yeah. Uh, we are out the door. It is National Signing Day. Bart's going to go back to work and be in the real world. Uh, don't forget, everything on the network, the interview with John Schuster uh, yesterday to catch up with him about Duluth FC. Des Moines is on the clock today. That'll be up later this afternoon, and we're doing some stuff for uh, in session, catching up with our friends at Southeast Whitfield on the high school side of things. Remember, you can go back and listen to the 1-1 draw, Woodward and Tri-Cities, and it took a late goal for Woodward to get the equalizer. That is also up on the network as well. So for everybody here at SDH, for Bart, who's actually in the office, I'm in the office. I'm leaving the office. Uh, mucha plata, y'all. Play it safe. Bart, send us home. Mucha plata, y'all. And don't tweet at the recruits. There you go. <laughs> Since it's the end of the show, that means I get to do this. We'll see you tomorrow.